the Easter. We are excited that you joined us this morning and looking forward to worshiping together on this Easter morning. We know it looks a little different. Our kids are excited to get to wear whatever they want. And Harrison picked his jockey goggles to show you. So we would uh, love to see where your families are watching the service and what you guys are wearing. So snap a quick pic and share it with us as we enjoy Easter together as a church family.
The setting of the sermon this morning is going to be a little bit unique. Uh, not unique in the fact of the scripture or the text. Luke 24 is a very familiar passage. Uh, the, the account of women coming to the tomb after the crucifixion uh, to minister and serve the body of Christ, finding an empty tomb. The uniqueness this morning is on actually where Earl is going to be delivering the sermon. He's on a hill just north of Weatherford. I think most of you will recognize it. The sermon this morning is entitled Easter's Dawn. Uh, we pray that this morning you will be filled with joy and encouragement as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. I grew up in a home on the southwest of Hobart, about six miles, and we lived on a hill, much like the hill I'm standing on today. And the house that I grew up in faced east. Every morning I could watch the sun come up over Elk Creek. It was beautiful. Some days it was spectacular. Uh, I just assumed everyone could see the sun come up. That's how I grew up for 18 years. I always saw the sun come up. Uh, well, I, I assumed wrong. When Nancy and I moved to Fort Worth, Texas so I could go to seminary, uh, there were way too many buildings between us and the east, and I never saw the sun come up. And then we spent almost two decades in eastern Oklahoma, and there were so many hills and trees out there that it wasn't that the sun was it wasn't this majestic rising so much as it was it just appeared uh, at some point and you could see and even here in Weatherford our home is located so that there's a lot of structures that are in the way uh, and I can't see the sun come up all the time I assumed I came to take for granted uh, the majestic sunrise uh, that I could see when I was growing up and if we're honest sometimes we take for granted the, maj the majesty of Easter and what it signifies as far as our hope for eternity. And we just, we get used to it and take it for granted. It's like the boy who was going to church on Easter, riding in the car with his dad. And he said, Dad, I don't even know why we're going. Uh, we already know what the sermon's going to be. Uh, it's going to be about the greatest event in the history of the world. And it's worth repeating and celebrating as often as possible. This morning, the text that we're going to look at as we uh, look at Easter is Luke's account in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12, as it documents uh, the coming or the resurrection of Jesus, emphasizing the fact that the women went to the tomb when it was early dawn, uh, much like here. Uh, the cross was behind them in the sense that it had happened on Friday, and it was early dawn, and here's how things unfolded. It says, but on the first day of the week, uh, at early dawn, uh, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found uh, the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Uh, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and, the, and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. The resurrection of Jesus was discovered and declared on that first Easter morning. This morning, we're going to declare uh, these things about that first Easter morning. I call this sermon Easter Dawn. First thing I want you to notice is that darkness preceded Easter's dawn. Uh, 
uh, darkness in the sense of not just that I've always heard that it's the, the night is darkest just before the dawn. I don't know how to calculate that. My dad used to tell me uh, that it was always colder just a little bit after the sun came up, and I've found that to be true through life, but I don't know if it really is darkest just after the dawn as far as how you can see. But I do know that spiritually speaking, before Easter's dawn, before the resurrection, uh, there was darkness in the sense of uh, spiritual darkness. When Judas was going out to set up the betrayal of Jesus, uh, Jesus told him, what you do, do quickly. And then in John chapter 13, verse 30, it said, and it was night. And it was night not just in the sense that it was dark outside, it was night in the sense that there was spiritual darkness, evil, the triumph of sin and Satan and all kinds of evil things that were happening. Darkness preceded uh, Easter's dawn. When Jesus uh, was confronted by the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers outside of Gethsemane, Jesus said, this is your hour when darkness reigns. So that's the kind of darkness I'm talking about. Uh, Easter's dawn uh, was preceded by darkness, uh, allowed darkness. The darkness that happened uh, was because God allowed it. No man took Christ's life. He laid it down. He had said in John chapter 10, no one takes my life away from me. I lay it down. Uh, when I was a boy, I used to enjoy reading Sport Magazine, one of the few magazines I ever subscribed to. I liked looking at the pictures of the athletes, like reading the stories. Uh, one story I remember was about Jim Brown, the great running back of the Cleveland Browns. After he had retired, a young reporter has make writing the story about him, and they played a game of pickup basketball in the driveway, make it, take it. And this reporter said that he, he was ahead nine to zero, going to 10. And then Jim Brown decided to start playing and he beat him 10 to nine. He won, he scored 10 buckets in a row. He, he toyed with him and then he took over. Uh, that's what happened when darkness preceded Easter's dawn. It was an allowed darkness. God allowed the things that were taking place or they wouldn't have taken place. It was also a chosen darkness in the sense that Judas chose to betray Jesus. Those who killed Jesus chose to do that. Evil choices were made. Even though God's in control of all things, there are choices that are made that have consequences, and the choice to sin, the choice to pursue and yield to temptation, those are choices that are made, and they were made that day. They were made that, that, that when Jesus was crucified, that people made choices. Darkness happened in the sense of all those things that happened to Jesus, but it was chosen. And people still today, we're accountable for the choices that we make. Yes, God is in control of all things, but we are accountable for the choices that we make. Uh, darkness preceded Easter's dawn, allowed darkness, chosen darkness, painful darkness. Uh, Jesus was nailed to a cross with spikes much like this. The pain of that could not be overemphasized. His brow was punctured. His back was beaten. He, there was excruciating pain that he went through as he laid down his life for the sins of the world. Um, there was uh, pain on the part of God himself. It says the, in the Bible, it says that for three hours between noon and three in the afternoon, uh, everything went dark. There was no, it, and I know God can see in the dark. I get that but it was like God himself couldn't bear to watch as his son took upon himself the sins of the world and became the permanent mercy seat for us as he absorbed the wrath of God against sin. There was this terrible pain that took place on, as darkness was a reality before Easter's dawn. Um, years ago, when Nancy and I went and watched The, uh, the Passion of the Christ, uh, when we exited the theater, no one said a word. It was just so overwhelming. The graphic display of the crucifixion of Jesus, which was more in tune with what really happened than what we are accustomed to with the, the pretty little pictures with a little bit of red here and a little bit of red there. Uh, he was beaten and he died. Uh, darkness preceded Easter's dawn. Easter's dawn revealed 
Christ's victory. When the sun came up and the women were legally, by Jewish law, they were able to travel, the Sabbath is over, now you can go. Uh, they were motivated more by their undying love than they were by practical insight. I mean, think about it. They leave and they make their way to where they know Jesus has been buried, where he's been placed in the tomb, and they're carrying the spices that they had purchased themselves. Now, first of all, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had buried Jesus. They had put 100 pounds of spices around his body to keep down the odor. They had wrapped the body in linen cloths. Uh, they had placed the body in the tomb. And so the little bit of spices that the women had, that's not going to be necessary. And then also, who's going to remove the wheel-like stone away from the front of the tomb? Uh, also, who's going to unwrap the body of Jesus and then put these spices in there and then wrap it back up? Uh, the Roman soldiers are outside. How are they going to slip by the Roman soldiers? There are just so many things in the way that they aren't really thinking about. They're just motivated by love. They want to go show and express their love for the one uh, that they had followed for so long. But when they showed up, Boy, what a change had happened between uh, Friday and Sunday morning. Uh, the stone had been rolled away by an angel of the Lord. It had terrified the Roman soldiers. They became like dead men, and then they skedaddled, got out of there. Uh, the tomb is open. The women go in, and the strips of linen cloth are there in the form of Jesus' body. The spices are still inside of that, but his body has vaporized. He's gone. As the angel moved the stone away, not so that Jesus could get out, but so the witnesses could get in and see what had happened. Over on the side of the tomb, uh, there was this cloth that had been over Jesus' face as though he had gotten up out of the linen strips, took the cloth that was over his face, folded it up, set it down, and evidence the fact that he had won victory. Easter's dawn revealed Christ's victory. Victory over death. That he had told them ahead of time, you kill me, I'm going to come back to life. Jesus himself had raised some people from the dead, but never before and never again has anyone said, you put me to death and I will come back to life. And he showed that he had won victory over death victory over sin, that he had conquered sin. The last, one of the last things that he said on the cross was paid in full, that the debt for our sin was paid completely for. It was completely paid for. But if Jesus would have stayed in the grave, that would have just been, he would have been just the latest religious lunatic. But when he comes out of the grave, he comes back to life. It validates his claim that all sins of all who believe in me are forgiven forever. He, he won victory over sin, your sin, my sin. It's paid for completely. He won that victory on the cross when, when Easter's dawn revealed Christ's victory, his victory over death, he came back to life, his victory over sin, his victory over Satan. What happened on Easter revealed, or this hope, Passion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ had been predicted way back in the Garden of Eden when God pronounces the curses on, on, on Satan. He said to Satan that the descendant of woman, you will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And that's what had happened. Sat Friday and the pain that Jesus endured, Satan's doing everything he can to bruise the, the Son of God, to eliminate the Son of God. And yet, when Jesus comes out of the grave, he crushes the head of Satan. Every plan Satan had to overcome the, the kingdom of God and to confront that, it's completely destroyed by what Jesus did when he came back to life. He wins victory over Satan. Even today, Satan has no more power in the life of a believer than we allow him to have. He's been defeated. He's a... He's a He's, he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, and that's what he does, and he's good at it. But those of us who know Christ can stand in the fact that Jesus has won the victory when he shed his blood on the cross, when he came back to life, and we have hope forever through that, that we, he's won the victory over not only death and sin, but also Satan. Darkness preceded Easter's dawn. 
and it was dark. It got bad, and then it got worse. But then Easter's dawn revealed Christ's victory. Christ's victory offers hope. Hope is the happy anticipation of good. Hope is something that's guaranteed that you haven't seen yet. Uh, the, the worst thing about the pandemic that's going on now is an absence of, of hope. People can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's like, when is this going to end? Well, I'm here to tell you that because of Jesus, there's not just a little light like this at the end of the tunnel. There's a light like the one that's rising over the horizon. And that there's hope because of Christ's victory. Uh, Christ's victory offers hope. Hope for life after death. When Jesus came out of the grave and He's alive again, the angels say to the women in verse 5, Why do you seek the living among the dead? And the same could be said to us if an angel came to us in the cemetery when we're looking where our loved ones who knew the Lord are. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because the victory that Jesus won is that even when we die physically, we continue to live in the sense that we go to be with Christ, which is better by far. There is victory in the sense that uh, there is hope, uh, that there is life after death. Uh, you may have heard about Mr. Pease, uh, the follower of Jesus, that on his, on his tombstone in the cemetery it said, Pease ain't here, it's just the pod. Pease shelled out and went to God. And that's what happens to a believer. Uh, several years ago, there was a young man who had found out that you know they'd stopped treatment. Uh, he only had a few days to live. Uh, when I went to see him in his home, uh, when I greeted him, or when he greeted me, he simply said, I'm going to be with God. He didn't say, oh, I'm going to die, or I don't know what's going to happen. He just simply said, I'm going to be with God. And that's what he did. When, we, when a believer dies physically because of the victory that Jesus has won, we have the hope, hope for life after death. Hope for forgiveness after sin. Uh, when the women, you notice that when the women went and told the apostles what had happened, there were a lot of them was like, ah, I don't know if I believe that or not. It seemed like craziness what they're talking about. Uh, but there was one, and from John's account we know that there were two that went as fast as they could to the tomb. It says Peter left and he went there to go see what was happening. John's account tells us that John also went. John outran Peter. Uh, there's no substitute for young legs. Uh, John wouldn't, look, wouldn't go in, but when Peter got there, he went in and he... Why did he go in? What's he so excited about? He has hope, great hope, that there is forgiveness. Because the last time that Jesus and Peter looked at each other, Peter had just denied Jesus the third time. He had just heard the rooster crow the second time. He had gone and wept bitterly, but there's no reconciliation between him and Jesus. The fact that Jesus is alive means his sin can be forgiven. He can be reconciled with Jesus, that, that there can be a restoring of that broken relationship. And that's what it still means for you and for me is that the resurrection of Jesus, Christ's victory offers hope of forgiveness after sin. That Jesus died on the cross for the purpose of our sins being forgiven, no matter what you've done, no matter how far away from God you feel like you are, no matter what has occurred, you have hope that forgiveness can be a reality, not because you try harder or because you've had bad breaks in life, but because Jesus really did come back to life. And since he came back to life, there is hope. Hope for life after death. Hope for forgiveness after sin. Hope for all who believe. The criteria that the New Testament gives for everyone to benefit from what Jesus accomplished on the cross is that we believe. Most famous verse in the Bible God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him 
will not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't, Jesus' resurrection from the dead doesn't just mean everybody goes to be with God when they die. It means those who believe receive forgiveness of sin. They live even after they die. About an hour ago, it was dark as pitch out here. You couldn't see a thing. But now the sun has risen, and it makes all the difference in the world. Your world right now may seem very dark. It may be without hope. But I'm telling you this Easter morning, 2020, that the sun, S-O-N, has risen. And He makes all the difference in the world. Since He has risen, it means that your sins can be forgiven. It means that you can have life. You can continue to live even after you die. It means you can know today joy inexpressible and full of glory. That you can have a peace that passes understanding. That you can receive God's unmerited favor over and over again, not because of who, who you are, but because of what Christ has done and what He can do in your life. Yeah, darkness preceded Easter's dawn. It was dark, and it's still dark today around us. Easter's dawn revealed Christ's victory, and that victory still is available today, and that victory offers hope, hope for life after death, hope for... Uh, hope for forgiveness after sin, and hope for all who will believe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your plan, your plan that included Jesus' death on the cross, but also included his resurrection from the dead, his plan, your plan that includes all of us who will believe. We thank you for the hope we have because of Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light.
Maybe you're feeling the weight of the darkness that Earl mentioned in his sermon today. And we want you to know that we want to meet you in that place and that you're not alone. Go to the FBC Weatherford website and there's a form there on the homepage that you can fill out letting us know what prayer request you have. Or if you want us to just give us your phone number, we would love to give you a call and reach out and visit with you. Um, because we have a loving father and a redeeming father who it gives us much reason for joy and we want to live that with you and be able to walk together through these dark times along 